On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, Tesla releases some impressive production and delivery numbers for the now completed year of 2018. Progress continues on Gigafactory 3 in Shanghai. I've got some notes and some learnings from my 1600 total mile round trip in my Model 3 and more. What's happening, friends? I'm Ryan McCaffrey. Happy New Year to you. Welcome to 2019. To my left, curled up in a little boxer ball, would be, of course, Daisy the Boxer Puppy, who was the perfect, perfect road trip companion. She could not have been a more well-behaved dog. I will tell you about my adventures to San Francisco, to Phoenix, and back later on in the podcast. But for now, I wanted to get things started right away with, uh, besides the Happy New Year wish, which, uh, by the way, I'd like to say thank you to Elon Musk for kindly returning my Happy New Year wish. He uh, wrote right back and said Happy New Year, which made me feel really good. Happy New Year to all of you. Here's to a great 2019 for all of us, for you, for me, for Tesla, and hopefully for, uh, for the world at large. Let's have some fun. Model S, Model X, Model 3, Semi, Roadster, Model Y, whatever you're wanting to see. Whatever you're wanting to buy, uh, here's hoping we have a lot of fun. Well, Elon Musk did take to Twitter, uh, not just to say Happy New Year to be, but also uh, on New Year's Day, he said simply, Congratulations, Tesla team, exclamation mark, uh, with a picture of a bunch of team members, which I would presume were from an L.A. area store or delivery center, since he, of course, spends most of his time down in the Los Angeles area. Now, it's hard to draw any firm conclusions from that because there was no other context for, uh, for what he was inferring there or what he was meaning. So that really leaves me only to speculate, though I do have some uh, more concrete information to, to throw at you here in a minute. But I think if we just kind of look at that tweet in isolation and, the, and that message, I will say, you know, things look good. You know, if he's putting that out there, that's a good sign. But I have to admit that given how hard Elon was pushing the about to reduce tax credit over the the course of the final week of the quarter and the the year uh, heading into the the reduction of that that federal tax credit, I have to say I couldn't help but think that maybe they weren't quite going to make their delivery goal and thus maybe not quite make their overall profitability goal. For the quarter, because yeah, and they'll tell you that last week he was out there on Twitter almost every day saying, "Hey, just you know, X days or X hours left to get the full seventy five hundred dollar tax credit." And some stores were staying open till midnight on December thirty first with inventory. If you wanted to come in and buy something and get the full tax credit eligibility there, so um, I don't know. You know, it's hard to say, but. Uh, I think it's going to be very close either way as far as profitability goes. You know, it's we had the full that nice three hundred million dollar profit in Q three, which was a fairly substantial amount. And I got to figure it's going to be less than that either in the black or in the red for Q four. We'll find out officially very soon, probably no more than about a month. The earnings call and shareholder letter usually go out. Um, about a month after. So it's probably going to be early February for that. Now, that said, Tesla did release a couple of days later their final production and delivery numbers. And I want to read you some of this. They say production in Q4 grew to 86,555 vehicles, which is 8% more than our prior all time high in Q3. This included over 61,000 Model 3s in line with our guidance and 15% more than Q3. Over 25,000 S and X, uh, that is combined there, uh, test loading consistent with our long-term run rate of approximately 100,000 per year. Q4 deliveries, now remember production was 86,555. Q4 deliveries grew to 90,700 vehicles, 
which was 8% more than our prior all-time high in Q3. This included over 63,000 Model 3s, 13% growth there over Q3, 13,500 Model S, and 14,000 Model X. Now, that may be the first time uh, I am going anecdotally off my own memory here because this is <laughs> this is actually something I'm just now seeing in my notes. I didn't really realize it as I was taking my notes. This might be the first time that Model X has uh, has out produced, uh, or actually I should say out delivered would be the more accurate term here. That they've delivered more X's in any quarter than S's, uh, which which long ago, if you go way 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 back to before the Model X actually released when we we knew about it we knew what it was but it just hadn't come out yet you thought there, there were a lot of uh people that thought oh well you know the in the suv craze north american market uh the model x could actually outsell the s to date that hasn't quite borne out they've been about 50 50 but usually the small edge uh, in in production and deliveries has gone to the model s but not in q4 so i found that find that pretty uh interesting Continuing here, Tesla says in 2018, so for the year total, we delivered a total of 245,240 vehicles, 145,000 plus Model 3s, and 99,000 plus S's and X's. To put our growth into perspective, we delivered almost as many vehicles in 2018 as we did in all prior years combined. That's awesome. And then Tesla, uh, a couple more notes here. Our Q4 Model 3 deliveries were limited to mid- and higher-priced variants, cash uh, and loan transactions, and North American customers only. More than three-quarters of Model 3 orders in Q4 came from new customers rather than reservation holders. Their note continues, Moving beyond the success of Q4, we are taking steps to partially absorb the reduction of the federal EV tax credit, which as of January 1st, i.e. now, dropped from $7,500 to $3,750. Starting today, we are reducing the price of Model S, X, and 3 in the United States by $2,000. They conclude by saying Tesla's achievements in 2018 likely represent the biggest single-year growth in the history of the automotive industry. We started the year with a delivery run rate of about 120,000 vehicles per year and ended it at more than 350,000 vehicles per year, an increase of almost 3x. As a result, we're starting to make a tangible impact on accelerating the world to sustainable energy. Additionally, 2018 was the first time in decades that that an American car, the Model 3 in this case, was the best-selling premium vehicle in the U.S. for the full year, with U.S. sales of Model 3 roughly double those of the runner up. Now, what to pick out of this? First of all, just to be extra clear for uh, for new listeners out there, for those of you who, who might be new to the show, the federal tax credit on purchasing any, uh, any Tesla is now $3,750. That's going to run from now until June 30th. So again, just want to clarify that in case you might be new to things. And, uh, and don't have the full picture, you're, maybe you're still learning. And then, just to, again, just to lay it out for you, it will go to a quarter credit, so it'll be an $1,875 federal tax credit from July 1st of this year through the end of the year, through December 31st. Now, that's unless that bill that was introduced in the House a couple months ago happens to get anywhere, meaning into law, Uh, which it's a long way from doing. So for now, for now, we have to operate as if the current system will remain in place and that the tax credit is going to phase out forever on uh, the current current, uh, phase out that that it's already occurring. Now as to the rest of this, so the price drop, the $2,000 price drop, as you might expect, really set off the fudsters and the shorts. They, they really glommed right onto that. Demand is weak, they cried. And while uh, I will once again remind you that, yes, I, I openly tell you that I'm a Tesla fanboy, and yes, I give Tesla the benefit of the doubt most of the time, I am also a trained journalist. I have a journalism degree, and I've been a working journalist for over 16 years. So I say that 
because uh, what I mean by that is that I am going to look at things whenever I can, you've heard me say this before, from the 10,000 foot view, from pulling back and taking a look so that you can see the entire picture rather than just a little zoomed in piece of it. And when I do that, the thing that I keep coming back to is this. Does anyone really think that Tesla simply haphazardly cut the price by $2,000 on each of the three cars at the last minute? Like there was a fire drill in the last week of December and they were like, oh my goodness, the tax credit, what will we do? People will think the cars are more expensive because in a sense they are. What do we do? Oh, we'll just, we'll just cut the prices a little bit. No, they planned it the whole time. Of course, there's smart people running Tesla. They've known that the tax credit phase out was happening and they know that they have high margins on all three cars. So they've of course had this built into their plans and built into their financial projections for a long time now. Uh, anyway though, that aside, the numbers look great and of course I hope that Tesla did achieve profitability for Q4. As I said a few moments ago though, I do think it's gonna be close either way. I, I think red, whether it's in the red or in the black, I don't think it'll quite be $300 million. But um, we'll, that remains to be seen. Like I said, we're probably about four weeks, about 30 days from finding that out. Um, but, you know, hey, let's not let that production number for the year go unnoticed. A run rate of 350,000 and actually delivering 245,000 cars, that's, that's fantastic. 245,000 cars in a year, that's not easy to do especially when you don't have dealer lots that purchase huge blocks of cars that they then just sit on. Tesla alluding to that uh, in their, their note as well, where they said, hey, are, we have, our, we have a, a lower uh, number of cars that we're just sitting on than anyone else in the industry, and that's a large reason why. So uh, every, you know, every month, because every Tesla that gets made is sold. So another thing I want to touch on is that figure, the 75% of Model 3 orders being from new customers rather than from reservation holders. You know, I, I, uh, I would think that the bears would say that it means that Tesla is out of reservations, and the bulls would say that it means new people are coming into the tent. And really, I think, uh, I think it's both, quite, quite honestly with you. I think the Tesla is working through the reservation queue, but on the other side of it, plenty of folks continue, continue to wait for that standard battery car. And uh, yes, also new people are coming into the tent. And here's the other thing, European and Chinese orders have only just begun and not a single dollar of that revenue is going to be realized until this quarter, Q1, that's just begun. So there's simply a lot of upside left for Tesla. We all know that as, as people who keep an eye on the company and, and root for the company. There's so much upside. And, and at the end of the day, the, the conclusion is this. Bravo to the entire Tesla team who worked so hard in 2018 to grow the company by such a substantial amount. I mean, what, what tremendous growth in 2018. Here is to continued growth and success for Tesla in 2019. On a related note, Model 3 continues to have a very strong showing on the monthly United States sedan sales charts. It moved up a notch in December to number four, trailing only the Camry, the Accord, and the Civic. It moved ahead of the very popular Toyota Corolla. Shout out to Clean Technica. I want to thank them for the handy bar graph that showed this as well as the data that they collected. I mean, Camry, if you look at that chart, Camry and Accord are pretty far ahead, for being honest. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm not sure Tesla would be able to overtake those two, even with the full, once they hit that 10,000 cars per week production goal. But, but maybe, you know, maybe, because once the actual... $35,000 car is shipping, 
who knows? <laughs> who knows if uh, if they might be able to to outpace even the Camry and the Accord. But for the immediate future, that number three car on the list, the Civic, the Model 3 is within spitting distance of that. So the Model 3 may soon be moving up in the charts again here in the coming two to three months. Next this week, Elon Musk might be paying a visit to China in the not too distant future. Now we already know that the initial work to prepare the land in Shanghai for construction of Gigafactory 3 is already underway. And this week, Elon replied to a tweet on the subject of Tesla sales in China. And he said this, quote, looking forward to visiting soon for the groundbreaking of Gigafactory Shanghai. That visit may very well happen in the next month or two. And the reason I suspect that is not only the, the preparation of the, of the land that's going on at the site, but Vincent from Irvine is a listener who, uh, and just a community member who seems to really have his ear to the ground with regard to all things related to Tesla in China. He posted this on his Twitter, quote, Tesla China has obtained a construction permit uh, for Gigafactory 3 from the Shanghai Municipal Government. The construction permit date starts from December 29th, 2018. The Tesla China construction permit is good for two stages of construction, totaling 180 days. So uh, look for a groundbreaking coming up fairly soon. It's going to be no more than six months, it sounds like, but probably sooner than that. Speaking of China... We have a bit more detail now about those 19-inch performance aero wheels that had shown up on the Chinese Model 3 design studio that I talked about, I guess, two or three shows or so ago now. The additional details come, uh, at least I saw it on Tesla Roddy, so I wanted to give them credit and quote them. They note, Tesla notes in the item's description that the Power Sport wheels, which might just be, by the way, the Power Sport, that might be a translation thing. It might be Performance Sport, but for now, we'll just go with the the more direct translation. Tesla notes in the item's description that the Power Sport wheels are designed for, quote, balanced performance and cruising range, end quote. Just like the 18-inch aero wheel covers uh, in on the North American cars, the 19-inch Power Sport wheels include a detachable hubcap that can, quote, better adapt to different road conditions. Based on Tesla's Model 3 configurator in China, the 19-inch Power Sport wheels are exclusive to the Model 3 performance, much in the same way here, uh, I'm noting here now, of course, that the 20-inch wheels uh, can only be ordered on the performance car unless you buy them aftermarket. Uh, Thus, customers who order the long-range all-wheel drive Model 3 are only able to choose between the familiar 18-inch aero wheels and the 19-inch sport wheels found in North American units. Thank you, Tesla Roddy. And, uh, you know, the interesting nugget to me there is, okay, yeah, a name of them and a little bit better description, but the fact that it's confirmation that they are indeed a cap, a wheel cover, that can be removed if you want to run with whatever the design underneath is, which I know, I and I see it around, a lot of people do that with the 18-inch aero wheels now. A lot of people buy a, a, a hub and wheel set, that Tesla T logo, to throw it on the, the uncapped version of that 18-inch wheel. So there's no mention of whether or not these wheels are forged or not, because as I mentioned last week, when discussing those new Model 3 wheels, that are, that are the referral program prize, uh, That's I, I wondered at that time if, if that might be these wheels, and I'm still wondering that. In fact, I think at this stage, there's probably a 50-50 chance, quite a, I bet it's a coin toss, that these are the, the wheels that we're going to see as that referral program prize in the summer of 2019. So if so, well, hey, then they seem pretty cool, and they're kind of a nice a hybrid of of the sport and the arrow so you know you get a little extra range out of them while uh, while having a bit of a sportier look than the than the 18 inch arrow wheel but if not if this isn't them and we're getting something else as part of that referral program prize 
then that's certainly cool too, because again, that means we get another brand new wheel option on the Model 3, and if that does prove to be the case, we would then be up to four total wheel choices for the Model 3, and in fact, if you want to fudge the number a little bit, you could say six total wheel choices if you count the taking the aero caps off variants of the 18-inch the aero wheel and, and this 19-inch uh, wheel as well. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. It's, it's good to see more choices, though. Uh, just a couple of other notes from Elon on Twitter this week. He mentions that the official EPA rating has come in on the mid-range Model 3, and rather than it being rated at 260 miles, which is what Tesla had estimated the mid-range Model 3 battery at, it is in fact 264. So, you know, that's not going to uh, change the game for you in a material way, but it's nice. Hey, four extra miles, a little extra range never hurt anybody. It only helps you. That's, that's good stuff right there. And finally, all left-hand drive European countries can now order the Model 3. So I want to wish congratulations to everybody in Europe in the left-hand drive country who's finally able to place their order after almost three years of waiting and watching the Americans and the Canadians get their cars. This is great news for, uh, for all those reservation holders in Europe. And I can't wait to see, I can't wait to see the Model 3 start to take over European roads. That is going to be cool. And I want to also note too that Tesla pretty well kept their word on this one. If you remember back when European orders first opened, actually, yeah, it was, it was almost exactly 30 days ago as of uh, my recording of this here on January 4th, uh, the Tesla had, at the time, you know, had, had invited just a few countries at first and then started adding more countries. And they said at the time, hey, all European, all left-hand drive Model 3 European reservation holders are going to be able to order the car within a few weeks. And, well, it's been four weeks, and they've, they've uh, kept that promise. So good stuff there. Can't wait to hear from all of you. As, as folks in Europe start to take delivery, I really want to hear from you guys to see not only what you think of the car after waiting even longer than a lot of the Americans and Canadians have waited for it, but I'm also keenly interested in how... Europe in general, you know, people that, in, that find you on the street, in the, sh in the shopping, you know, the grocery store, parking lot, whenever, wherever you're out and about, I'm very curious about how Europe in general will react to the Model 3, just to see if it's any different of a reaction than what we have gotten with it uh, from, from passersby in America. Finally this week, one last item of news you know, you may have heard a lot recently about the so-called icing trend that's, uh, that may or may not be a thing at superchargers lately. I did not run into any of it here in California on my or Arizona on my uh, recently completed 1,600 total mile round trip. But we've seen a number of social media posts, a number, number of Reddit posts that have caught wind of this and kind of uh, really gone viral because it's, and that's the thing, it's like, I, the reason I say may or may not be a thing at superchargers is, is because, you know, it's, it's just some, a handful of posts that have gotten a lot of attention, and it's hard to know how widespread it really is. You know, if, if you're not familiar at all with what I'm talking about, if you're like, well, what? What are you talking about? Icing, superchargers? So this kind of all kicked off with a post on the Tesla Motors subreddit that was voted up so much it ended up, it made it to the front of the Reddit homepage when a few very large trucks, just like big jacked up, you know, four by four kind of trucks, intentionally blocked multiple supercharger spots at a uh, North Carolina supercharger and they started chanting blank Tesla, blank Tesla. And you can, you can fill in the blanks with your own imagination there. From there... A few more reports of similar activity started popping up. And now, what I, you know, I hesitated to bring this up because is it really news? Is it really relevant to your interest, to your time? And I thought, well, you know, I guess it can't hurt to address because I, what I want to say about this is that this may just be people doing this for attention, knowing that it's going to get posted on social media. 
And if that's the case, really, even if it's not the case, regardless, I, it's not my position here to, as, a, as a guy doing a podcast to lecture anyone. I don't know any better than you or anyone else. I, I have my perspective on things and how I see things and whatnot, but I'm, I'm, no, I'm no better or worse than, than anybody else. But in my opinion, my take on this, uh, if you want to, you know, ignore this, agree with me, whatever, but if you do happen to see this behavior, I would respectfully and politely urge you to not react. Ignore it, move to a different charger that's as far away from possible, far away from the, you know, people doing this kind of thing as possible if you see it. Uh, I may, maybe try not to leave your car unattended if you can avoid that, if, if you find yourself in that situation. And, and quite frankly, worst case, call the police if necessary. I mean, if, if there is a disturbance, if you don't feel safe, call the police. And if, if for some reason you just can't not react, which, I, believe me, I completely understand that kind of thing, I would simply urge you, again, with, with peace and love, to stay positive, stay humble, stay polite, uh, you know, say, just give information on the car, uh, be, you know, be p- proactively nice about it, kill them with kindness, as the saying goes, and if, if again, that's if you've got to say anything at all, I, I think the first, first line of defense is probably just to ignore it and not, not give them the attention that they're probably looking for, but I did want to end this constructively rather than come off as like me. <laughs> again, I, I don't I don't want to seem like I'm lecturing anybody because again, it's not my place to do so. But I want to say I want to thank the Tesla Motors Reddit user who goes by the username Too Much to Do Today, who provided the link I'm about to give you. So this link, if you go to this site, it details the so-called icing laws state by state. So what you know the, the laws that pertain to non-electric cars parking in electric car charging spots. So if you go to pluginsites.org slash plugin vehicle parking legislation reference, and the the latter part of that, so pluginsites is all one word, dot org slash plugin vehicle parking legislation reference, and in that part of it, there's a there's a dash, a hyphen between each of the words. So plug dash in dash vehicle, you get the idea. So if you go to that website, you can look state by state at what the laws are, just so you're aware if this does happen to you, kind of what what you, you know, what sort of options you may have available to you. Uh, believe me, it seems bizarre to me. It's it not seems it is. It's bizarre that this is even a thing that's bubbled up enough <laughs> over the last a little while here in the community that it that it merits discussion and mention on this podcast but as i throw my hands into the air here we are all right well let's get back to happier things by going through some of your excellent phone calls in the ride the lightning hotline as usual a bunch of great stuff queued up from you guys i'm going to hear from you here right after this Time for the Ride the Lightning Hotline, your questions, comments, discussion topics as they pertain to the world of Tesla. If you want to participate, which I always invite you to do so, you can reach me one of two easy ways. Either record a question on your smartphone that's between 60 and 90 seconds, please, and email that file to me at teslapodcast at gmail.com. Alternatively, you can call anytime 24-7 and leave a message on the Ride the Lightning hotline. The toll-free number for that is 1-888-989-8752. That's 1-888-989-TSLA. And that brings me to, of course, the hotline plug. If you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they're special. The recordings can be podcasted or put onto a keepsake. Visit lifeonrecord.com to learn more. Up first is Christy from Silicon Valley. I'd put out the call a while ago, hoping to hear from some folks who actually took their Performance Model 3s to the track and turned on track mode and actually used it. 
Christy has done just that and kindly called in about that. Christy, you're on the air. Hey, Ryan, it's Christy from Silicon Valley. I wanted to call in and share my experience with track mode and my P3D. I was super excited to find out that track mode was going to be released the very week that I was planning to take my car up to a high performance driving course at Thunder Hill Raceway in Willows, California. I had the car up there for the weekend and was simply blown away. I had driven my long range Model 3 on a couple of raceways before, but the difference with the performance Model 3 and the track mode really made a difference. Um, I didn't feel like I had any problems with the the brakes feeling like they were starting to get soft. Um, The car handled great out of all the corners. It was such a fun experience. So um, I would say that the only downside to the whole weekend was that there are not superchargers really close to that raceway. So you do have to plan. And um, I'm very lucky that I have my husband as a pit crew. So he went and charged the car up during lunch while I was at driver's meetings. But um, you could probably get two to three full sessions um, without having to go to a supercharger. You can use the... 1450 NEMA outlets that are there at the track, probably for RV purposes. But um, hopefully they'll start to put superchargers at tracks soon. And um, that won't be something that you have to worry about as much anymore. But anyways, wanted to um, thank you again for your great coverage of all Tesla news and continue to uh, keep up the great work. Congrats on the Roadsters and Happy New Year. Thank you, Christy. This is awesome. I have been very eager to hear from someone who's actually gone out to a proper track with track mode. Boy, it sounds like a really fun time. I'm going to have to add that to my Tesla to-do list, Uh, by the way, along with those classes that you mentioned that they had. Happy electric racing, (laughs) which is a form of motoring, certainly. Eric from Australia is up next and wanted to make a 2019 prediction about the Tesla Semi. Eric, you're on the air. Thank you, Ryan. Eric Levin from Australia, and I would like to wish you and all your listeners a very happy Tesla New Year. I may have to start planning a trip to U.S. to see your new roadster when you get it. Well done and well deserved. Just wanted to add to your New Year's prediction. I didn't notice any mention of the Tesla Semi. I would expect first customer deliveries to happen in the fourth quarter opening floodgates for more orders. Love to know your thoughts on this. Also want to tell you that I really enjoyed hearing about your road trip to Phoenix. Felt like I was there with you. Great work. Love the show and look forward to each and every podcast. Keep well. Cheers. Thank you, Eric, and Happy New Year to you, too. You know, I suppose I did leave out the Tesla Semi, and I'm guessing you noticed because if my memory serves me correctly, because you've called in a number of times before, I believe you're a truck driver yourself. Uh, Anyway, yeah, Tesla's been rather quiet about the Semi lately. I mean, in the the matte black Semi prototype, which is one of the two, the other one's the silver one, that matte black one was recently redone in matte red, and it was spotted at the Kettleman City Supercharger here, a couple hundred miles south of San Francisco. And it turns out, in fact, that I missed that semi. I missed seeing it at Kettleman City by 24 hours from when I was there on my way to Arizona. So anyway, the prototypes are continuing to work out in the field. You know, I I guess I suppose it's hard to hide them, number one, (laughs) since they're semi-trucks. And number two, it's probably fairly impossible to really test them anywhere except out in the real world actually hauling things. Whereas the Roadster, as you know, which obviously was unveiled at the same time at the same event, that car could be tested on private tracks away from prying eyes. The, The Semi, not so much. But back to your comment, Eric. Given the number of fleet orders that Tesla has for the Semi, You may very well be right that those first deliveries might happen by the end of the year. I do feel like Tesla's, uh, I don't know if backed off is the right word, but, you know, they'd originally said, hey, 2019 first deliveries. I just feel like we haven't heard any uh, reaffirmation of that in a while. So we'll see. They certainly are going to want to get it right. um, But I, I would not at all be surprised if those first deliveries happened by the end of this year. I hope so. 
I mean, at the very least, we will probably get an answer to the question this year of where they will be built. I mean, as I've said, and it's, believe me, it's not like this is some bold prediction, it's likely going to be at Gigafactory 1, because that's where the drivetrains for the semi are already being manufactured, the battery packs are already <laughs> being manufactured there, and unlike Fremont, they have nothing but room up there to, to build and build and build. So we'll see what happens. Heather from Colorado is next. Wanted to react to my comment about the bizarre clunking sound coming from underneath the Model 3 or down in the, the floor uh, that I mentioned on my first trip from San Francisco to Phoenix. Heather, what can you educate me with here? Hi, Ryan. This is Heather from Colorado. I just finished listening to episode 178 where you asked the question about the funk or clunk that you hear on the floor of your Model 3. I emailed service about this and they responded that this is a known characteristic of the Model 3 and that it is just um, some expansion and contraction of the sheet metal on the floor near the battery pack. It must be affected by heat uh, and cooling, and it is just the sheet metal uh, expanding and contracting and is normal and not a problem. And it did annoy me for a little while, but once I know it's just the characteristic of my car, uh, it's not a problem. Thanks so much for your podcast. Really enjoy learning about my Tesla. Have a great day. Happy New Year. Thank you for the call, Heather. It's reassuring to know that I'm not the only one who's dealt with this. And, and by the way, I'd like to thank you for having already done the work of checking into it with Tesla directly. I mean, that explanation does make sense, though I would say that's a bit of an unfortunate design characteristic. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't intended, but, eh, you know, it's a bit of a bummer. It's not a huge deal, but it's it's one of those things where, and I, I mean, I, I hate to, to pull this card, but, you know, hey, for what the car costs, you'd prefer for a, a, a strange noise like that to not be there, you know? But I guess I suppose I've never run into it up until this road trip of mine, because having never left the Bay Area in my car until this trip... It's literally always between 48 and 68 in San Francisco. And even, you know, the wider Bay Area is, uh, you know, gets a little warmer, but it doesn't really get cold. So there just isn't any proper cold weather like what I encountered in the mountains outside of Los Angeles here, you know, late December on my trip that seemed to trigger it. But ultimately, though, uh, uh, partially and thanks to you for reassuring me, I'm, I'm just glad it's nothing to worry about. So thanks, Heather. Douglas in Kentucky is the owner of a Model S as well as a BMW i3. Wanted to talk about V3 supercharging and how it might relate to both of those cars. Douglas, go ahead. Hey, Ryan. Douglas in Kentucky. I'm a Model S owner and also own a BMW i3. And um, just about the uh, mo a version 3 of the superchargers, um, you know, we've heard about the CCS, uh, the combo adapter being part of the version three in, in or in Europe. We've heard about, we've seen these things. Uh, and I'm wondering about in the U.S. if possibly Tesla would do that here. And further, I thought, you know, me being an i3 owner, uh, would Tesla consider allowing, you know, if the other manufacturers are not going to join in and, you know, at, at the corporate level, would Tesla somehow maybe be able to get software to allow uh, non-Tesla cars to pay for access at, with, with the uh, DC uh, CCS combo charging? Even if it was, a, 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 you know, a higher rate, um, I think a lot of people would, 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 would go for that. I don't know. Just thought about it. Was kind of intrigued by the idea. Thanks for your show. Been a long listener and will continue to be. See ya. Tesla has repeatedly said that they're open to it, Douglas, but the thing is no manufacturer has come to them. Personally, based on the general industry reaction to and treatment of Tesla, 
I believe, this is just me, I believe it's a case of other companies perceiving a Tesla supercharger partnership as some sort of violation of their pride or, or at least a swallowing of that pride. And that's why we've had no movement on it as of yet. I mean, the, the problem though for other car manufacturers and thus, and, and more importantly, for customers of the other electric vehicles that are coming out of some of these companies is that every day they wait to build out a high-speed charging network means that Tesla gets farther and farther ahead of them with theirs, which gains Tesla an enormous competitive advantage. And yes, that's great for Tesla, but it's not necessarily great for EVs overall. Because, you know, it's it's not only an advantage in, in that macro sense, this, that sort of top of mind, you know, the obvious sense, but if you zoom in for the micro view on that, and you see that, that Tesla is gobbling up a lot of the best geographic spots for superchargers too, which is only going to make it more expensive for other companies to come in and compete in that space moving forward. So here's hoping that, that those other companies get themselves in gear on it soon, if you'll pardon that unintentional car pun. Get it in gear. Anyway, <laughs> as to your thought on Tesla taking the... Uh, the initiative to build general compatibility into the, the superchargers. I suppose it is possible, but I think it seems like it might create a nightmare for Tesla owners to, to try and, and do that in any sort of unregulated or uncontrolled way. Uh, meaning, you know, a nightmare for Tesla owners because there's all these other people kind of coming in that aren't prop that haven't sort of gone through the proper channels as it were. But I mean, it's, it's a thought that I would think something that maybe Elon and the team would, would at least consider as part of the achieving of the ultimate mission of Tesla. Let's go to Simon in Sheffield, who got to see the Model 3 up close for the first time recently. Simon, you're on the air. Hi, Ryan. It's Simon calling from Sheffield in England. Uh, I've been listening to you since the Model 3 was announced on March 31st. Um, and love your podcast, find it really informative, and in case I miss out on any Tesla news in a week, it's just great to have you uh, as backup uh, in case uh, any breaking news stories come in that I've missed. Um, we had the fortunate experience of going to be able to actually see a Model 3 in the UK um, about two weeks ago. Um, my wife, my daughter and I drove over uh, to Manchester and we had a, a quick look at the Model 3. Um, it was a great car. Uh, it was the black interior premium upgrades obviously um and yeah i was really impressed with it really like the look of it um it's a little bit smaller than the obviously than the s um but that's pretty much bang on for the tiny roads around here um so i can't wait for um, them to release a model that i'm ready to buy um hopefully next year um i had a quick question as well which was just around uh noise actually and um, we just had a, a baby girl and she copes really well in our um, ICE car, loves the um, the kind of white noise created by the engine and the wheels on the road, and it, it takes her off to sleep every time. But I'm just wondering if uh, you or your um, listeners have any experience with the rolling noise on a Tesla, whether that has a similar effect on young children. Um, she's just like a month old. Um, or if I'm going to have to bring some kind of white noise appliance when we go on our next road trip. Um, appreciate what you do, all the time and effort you put into it. Thanks very much. Look forward to hearing from you. Simon, you've got an excellent question here, and it's one that I'm afraid I can't help you with, given that my daughter is past that stage. I did look up, I uh, tried to look this up. I, I looked for some forum threads about it to hear from owners who've been through that baby stage with an electric car, but I couldn't really turn up anything. And so, as I do from time to time, you know, I'm, I am no know-it-all. I, I know my audience has plenty of collective knowledge out there. I would love to invite any parents in my audience who've had newborns in a Tesla, or I guess any electric vehicle for that matter, to call in and let Simon and others who may be in Simon's position now or in the future, let, let him and them know if your electric car effectively lulls your baby to sleep, or if the car is in fact too smooth and quiet for that particular purpose, which, you know... The, in, in basically any other use case, that's a good thing. But, but yeah, I could see, I, I, I went through that stage with, the, with my newborn daughter where it's, 
You do, you do anything you can to get them to sleep. We did the lap around the block a couple times. Thankfully, we didn't need to resort to it often, but I, uh, I can definitely sympathize and empathize with, with where you're at with it. So, But still, the most important thing here, though, congratulations, Simon, to you and your family. Raphael from Connecticut is up next with a response to that auto lane change cancellation that, that was happening to me on my trip and that a caller had called in about. Raphael, go ahead. Hi, Ryan. This is Raphael from Connecticut. I'm out with my dog, Ringo, taking a walk, uh, listening to your great podcast. I'm calling about the uh, nav on autopilot aborting lane changes. Um, I have uh, been driving on autopilot since I got the car and never experienced it till I uh, went on a 300-mile uh, round trip from Connecticut to uh, Rhode Island, and it happened to me three or four times. Um, the only difference between all my other times and that one trip is before the trip, I had changed the uh, nav on autopilot to Mad Max mode. Uh, since that trip, I put it back to, I think the next level down is average, I think. Um, and I haven't experienced it again. So I don't know if that's the uh, issue, uh, but at least for me, it stopped the aborted uh, lane changes. So I just wanted to pass that along. I know it'll be... Uh, upgraded and fixed i'm sure in future software updates enjoy your podcast ringo loves it as well because we get to go on nice long walks bye hang on a second here Raphael. are you telling me that you listen to the entire show on dog walks no matter how long the show is so <laughs> if that's the case are you cursing me for longer episodes or do you like the longer episodes because it gets you and your dog more exercise uh, I'm just, yeah, just kidding around with, with, uh, with you, although I am, I'm actually genuinely curious, but to your call, I see where you're coming from, but I'm not sure if that would, uh, actually address it. I think the big problem is that it's almost impossible to do an apples to apples comparison in it because you can't set up passing the same car at the same speed in the same spot very easily. You could, I guess, if you had enough friends and clear enough roads to set that up, but it'd be pretty difficult. But it is definitely a possibility. Cheers to you and to Ringo as well. Keith from Columbus is the next caller this week, wanting to respond to Leon about the uh, navigation voice volume. Keith, go ahead. Hi, Ryan. This is Keith calling from Columbus, Ohio. I was calling in response to a caller you had on the show last time from Avon, Ohio. Uh, he was having a problem with the volume of his navigation, and I think I have a, an answer my, for my fellow Buckeye. Um, the volume knob on the steering wheel is, con is context sensitive to in terms of what volume it's controlling. So if the music is playing, it controls the, the, the music volume. And if the navigation is, is saying something, if it's... Uh, providing some information then then that actually controls the navigation volume so what i think might be happening is when he when it comes up like he might have music playing and, and then it comes up and starts giving direction and then he's scrolling down to to turn down the volume thinking he's t turning down the music volume but in fact that he's actually turning down the navigation volume um, i think that's what's happening um, but you can see which it is you're controlling on the screen when you use the wheel there's an icon that that shows either the music note or a triangle for the navigation um, so hopefully that's the answer and, and hopefully that's what was causing it so now if he's if if he's aware of it then um, maybe you can prevent that from happening again in the future um, well thanks for everything you do ryan and i appreciate the show have a great 2019 well leon if you're out there i hope that might help you thank you very much for calling in keith uh, make sure to make sure to use the touch screen to adjust that navigation voice volume and not the scroll wheels. And that should set the nav voice volume specifically independent of your general media playback volume. I want to also say a quick thank you to Brad from Lexington, who also called in with this same information. Keith from Columbus uh, beat you by a little bit, Brad, so that's why I chose to play his call. But just wanted to make sure, Brad, that you get acknowledged as well. I didn't forget about you. Gary in Chicago, we'll keep it in the Midwest, uh, has a comment on those auto-sensing uh, wipers in the rain. Gary's got an idea about that. What do you got, Gary? Hey, Ryan. How are you doing? Happy New Year. My name is Gary. I'm calling in from Chicago. 
I'm just calling because I'm listening to your podcast right now and people were talking about um, the auto rain sensing wipers and how they could be improved. Um, and it came to me that maybe you could uh, triple or quadruple press the left um, stock button, the one you, you press for the wipers um, anyway. Um, a triple or quadruple press could probably, um, you know, turn on the wipers for extended periods of time like, like normal. Um, let me know what you think about that. I don't have a Tesla, so I can't get it into the uh, little um, suggestion box. So if you could, if you like the idea, or if anyone else listening likes the idea, if you could throw that in there, um, I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much for the podcast. I really do enjoy listening to it every week. It's a great source of information uh, for me as a fan. Have a happy new year. Congrats on everything that you've um, achieved with this podcast. I can't wait to um, uh, listen listen to you more as you uh, explore Tesla with your spirit of adventure and eventually get your, your new Roadster. Thanks and have a great day. Bye-bye. Gary, welcome to the podcast and thank you so much for your kind words and your constructive call. Well, let me cut right to the chase on this. I think it's a great idea. I think that's a really nice workaround to having to fumble around with the touchscreen at all while you're driving in the rain, which is just, you know, tends to be a, it's a little bit of a stressful time. You're trying to get everything sorted out. So since a single tap is for one wipe and holding that single uh, press does two wipes with the spray of the windshield washer fluid, maybe a double tap could turn on manual wiper setting one, triple tap for setting two, quad tap for setting three, and as you might guess where this is going, maybe the five taps in a row for those maximum, the level four setting on the manual wipers. It's It seems like the answer is there. Uh, you know, a non-touchscreen intuitive physical solution is there. So good stuff here, Gary. Thank you so much. Happy New Year to you as well. Keith, a.k.a. the Tesla Hillbilly from Missouri, is up next and has a question about charging. Keith, you're on the air. Good evening, Ryan. This is Keith, the Tesla Hillbilly from Missouri. Another fine podcast today with lots of good information. I have a question and a couple comments. First, the question. I have a Tesla Model 3 long-range rear-wheel drive. I periodically visit relatives and friends that have traditional NEMA 1030 clothes dryer plug-ins. However, at each of these locations, my standard Tesla cord is between 3 and 8 feet too short. I was wondering if you or your listeners knew where I could purchase an approved 10-foot extension so that I could charge at these locations. I already have the NEMA 1030 adapter that I need. And now for the comment. Two weeks ago on your podcast, a listener brought up free supercharging at certain locations. I can attest that I have experienced this phenomenon also. I've had my Model 3 for about six months now and have used this particular supercharger station six times and never been charged a fee. I've used two other superchargers and been billed. I'm not sure why I'm not billed with this supercharger, but I'm quite happy I am not. And finally, my 2019 prediction. The Model Y should have between four to 500 miles range for its battery. We shall see, I suppose. Here's wishing you and your family, including Daisy, a happy and safe new year. May 2019 have continued success and be your best year yet. Thanks and goodbye. Keith, thank you for the call and for the kind words. That is a, it's a great question about the extension cord. Tesla doesn't sell one themselves. I, I did check to make sure. I didn't think they did, and I went and just perused the store just in case. Sure enough, they do not have one. But places like Amazon and Home Depot have them for under $100, and they should work just fine for you. Now, I want to caution, always read the fine print, of course. But those extension cords should be rated for the 30 amp load. Now, as for your supercharger comment, I suppose the mystery continues on that, but maybe we should all stop talking about it before Tesla happens to figure that out. Uh, finally, another item in your call, I love your prediction for the Model Y, but my friend, I can't quite share your uh, high level of optimism on that. I mean... If any cars in the Tesla fleet are going to get to 400 or 500 miles that aren't named Roadster, 
I've got to figure it's going to be a new pack in the Model S and the Model X. I mean, remember, the Y is meant to be the X's baby brother. And while I don't doubt that Tesla will pack some cool new stuff into the car, that kind of range would probably make it more ex more expensive than the X even. So that's why I, I just don't personally see it, but it's possible that because it's going to be bigger and heavier than the three, that just maybe it'll end up with a slightly larger battery pack in order to maintain a 300-mile EPA-rated range at the top end. Thanks so much, Keith. Final call this week, the honor goes to Matorshin from Toronto. He's trying to plan his future Tesla purchase. I will do my best to help him out. Matorshin, you're on the air. Hey, Ryan. This is Matorshin uh, from Toronto. Hope you had an amazing new year. I can't congratulate you enough for uh, winning two Roadsters. I'm really happy for you. Um, and today I have a little curious question, I would say, uh, about my purchase of the Model 3. Uh, because I'm planning to uh, get a Model 3 this March. Um, at the same time, Tesla is releasing their Model Y. So I cannot really decide which one. I will actually, I think I will wait until they release the Model Y and, and decide. Uh, because what I really want from an electric car is range. Um, Model 3 have an amazing range, but... Where I live in Toronto, Canada, it's super cold, um, especially right now. It's like getting up to negative, negative 10, negative 20 degrees Celsius, which is freezing cold. But on that, those days, you know, electric cars will lose a lot of range. So it's good to have more range. And uh, yeah, I'd love to know your opinion on it. And uh, do you think uh, Model 3 will get any more range in 2019? Maybe Tesla would add a extended range uh, Model 3. I'd uh, love to know your opinion. Um, have a great New Year. Matershin, let's take your last question first. No, I don't think the Model 3 is going to get any more range in 2019. My opinion, I reserve the right to be wrong, like all my predictions from last year. The only new stuff that we are likely to get on the Model 3 this year, in my opinion, are standard battery, which uh, obviously has less range than the existing Model 3s, and smart air suspension. I think, as I talked about last week, that this year is likely to be all about growing and stabilizing production, continuing to be profitable, etc., etc. But to your thought about waiting for the why... Just want you to remember two things as you, as you sort of make your decision one way or the other. First, the Y is likely to have a touch less range than the Model 3 if the X compared to the S is anything to go by. Second, the Y won't be out for approximately two years after it's unveiled around that March 2019 time frame that Elon gave us on Twitter a few months back. Uh, and in fact, actually, there's another thing. Third, the Y is likely to cost a bit more than the 3, just as the X is more than the S. You know, the Y should be bigger than the 3 and will cost a bit more as a result. But I would say, if you can wait that long, then of course, hey, more power to you. Maybe the Y will fit your needs slash desires better. But if it ends up being... Uh, pretty close for you, like between the three and the Y, I would just keep those three things I just mentioned in mind, plus the fact that in two years, in other words, so if you bought a Model 3 now versus waiting for a Y, you could save a good bit of money on gasoline and other maintenance costs on your existing car in that time frame. So just, you know, all stuff to think about as you decide what's best for you on that one. Good luck whichever way you decide to go. Thanks again to everybody for calling in on the Ride the Lightning hotline. Again, it's a, it's an open door policy, an open phone policy. Please call in with your Tesla questions, comments, discussion topics, 
Again, record it on your smartphone and email that minute to minute and a half long file to me at teslapodcast at gmail.com. Alternatively, you can call in and leave a message anytime, day or night, at the Ride the Lightning hotline. That number is 1-888-989-8752. Be right back with some parting thoughts. Actually, I guess they're not quite parting thoughts. I still got to tell you about my return trip from Phoenix back to San Francisco and then I'll do uh, then I'll do the wrap up stuff for you right after this. Well, if you feel like sticking around, let me tell you about part two of my road trip. So I had a great time down down in Arizona. Saw the family. Saw a bunch of friends, including a couple friends I hadn't seen in in way too long. So that felt really good. And the Model 3 performed admirably for me. Um, I want to start by giving a shout out specifically to Izad, the service manager at the Tempe Tesla Service Center, and Austin, who's a service advisor in that location as well. So when I had gone to Phoenix originally, you know, you guys remember I took nail number three in the in the four months at the time I'd owned the car. So got that nail patched. That was front left tire. So that was patched up. Jermaine had come to my home and taken care of it. It was wonderful. But I had noticed that I was still, I was having to just put a little bit of air, like three, four PSI in it every four or five days or so. So I thought, well, this is a little odd. But I, you know, I just kept topping it up and I topped it up before the trip. And then I noticed by the end of the roughly 800 mile drive, I'd lost a few by the end of that. So when I got to Arizona, I started rattling that in my head some more. And I thought, well, this can't be right. This isn't supposed to be how this is. So let me make sure I don't have a slow leak somewhere that could uh, make for a bad time on my way home. Well, first I called, uh, I tried to make a service center appointment at either the Tempe or Scottsdale. There are two service centers in the greater Phoenix area. Both were booked until after I was scheduled to leave. Okay, that's out. I thought, all right, well, let me try, let me see if I can get a Ranger service. Like, I might have to pay a little bit more, but if I can get the the Tesla Ranger out to come take a look at it and deal with it, again, that's peace of mind, you know, because it's just, you don't want to be stuck somewhere halfway, you know, 500 miles from your house. So I called them up, and they were super nice, but they said, uh, unlike in the Bay Area, where there is a tire-specific ranger, that would be uh, Jermaine was the gentleman that had helped me uh, back, you know, again here in San Francisco. They don't have that specific service. The rangers can't do tires, uh, but they they did tell me on the phone. For those of you in the the Phoenix Valley area, that they are going to be uh, introducing that service to the Phoenix area in the not too distant future. So good news there, but didn't help me at the time. So the gentleman on the phone advised me, said, listen, um, you know, normally this, this isn't maybe your best course of action, but in your case, you know, it, it seems to make the most sense. He advised me to just walk in to either Tempe or Scottsdale, explain the situation and see if they might be able to squeeze me in at some point between, uh, you know, then and when I had to leave back, back for San Francisco, you know, and I, and I, and I said, okay, let me go do that. And I thought, well, if I can go in and, and get them to take pity on me and take a look at it, maybe I'll come back, you know, a few days, a day or two or three later before I have to leave. Well, uh, Izod and Austin uh, just took care of me right away. They were like, they just d- didn't even ask any questions. I explained the situation that I was an out-of-towner, and uh, they took took the car right back to the to the bay, the service bay. So I'm sitting there waiting and I'm catching up with a, an old friend of mine, one of the ones I hadn't seen in a while, who'd come along with me on that on that errand. And the the service team comes out. One of the gentlemen from the service team comes out and says, "Can can you come back here with us? We we just can't find anything." So we go back, and I'm thinking, "Oh man, what's going on?" And they they check the valve stem, they check the patch, which was fine. That Jermaine had done a perfect job on that. Anyway, and, and so finally, they're just like, well, we don't know, you know, there's 
So we just can't find anything here. I'm like, could the rim possibly be bent and at all in any way? I mean, I haven't hit anything, but uh, and they're thinking no. But they said, well, you could, for peace of mind, you could replace the tire, and uh, which I knew was going to be with mounting installation of the labor it would be 400 bucks. I was getting ready to say yes to that. I mean, just, I was literally just tossing it around in my brain when one of the techs went, oh, I found it. And it was right near the lip of the wheel. Like, I guess it just wasn't quite, it was like 99% seated, but not 100% seated on the, on the wheel properly. So sure enough, that's where the, the leak, the slow leak was coming from. And we all kind of had a good chuckle that <laughs> because there were like five, five people standing around looking at this tire, trying to figure this out. And, uh, and then they, they took immediate care of it and couldn't have been nicer. And it was just great. So um, they, were, they were just spectacular and really could not have had a better service experience there. Really from the, from the top down, from, okay, yeah, you know, there were no appointments when I tried to book online. I guess that's less than ideal. But then from when I called, from basically everybody I spoke to or interacted with directly was just wonderful. So great job to the Tempe Tesla team as well as the uh, the ranger that I spoke with on the phone. That was, uh, that was really great. I think his name was Logan, if I remember correctly, if he happens to be out there. So, uh, so that all went fine and well. Uh, and I, th- I told you about my charging cable situation last week. So I, ha- I made a couple of runs to the Scottsdale supercharger while I was there. I want to say, uh, give a shout out to Tyler from Arizona who recognized me. I was talking to another gentleman, uh, this guy named Daniel who had a signature red model S. Uh, and so of course I parked next to him and charged next to him. Cause I could have multi-coat red next to, next to uh, signature red and these were the urban superchargers, so I wasn't siphoning any of his charge or vice versa. And I was having this nice conversation with Daniel, and Tyler heard me, heard me talking and recognized my voice. He said, Ryan? <laughs> so we talked to him for a little while. The, the three of us were chatting. And what a great conversation. I just, again, I've said this before, but I just want to reiterate, for those of you who are new owners or awaiting delivery or you're going to be getting your Tesla at some point in the future, I just didn't realize before I got my car for all the self-education I did on Teslas and the Tesla community and, and everything about the cars themselves and the world of Tesla, I simply hadn't realized how great the superchargers are in, in, as a community tool. Every supercharger stop, every supercharger has the potential to be an impromptu Tesla club gathering. They're not all like that. I've, I've made plenty of supercharger stops where people just don't want to chat or, you know, what, whatever. There's, it's, they're not all social gatherings. But, you know, I tend, when I want to talk to people, I'll stand outside my car and just kind of hang out. And, you know, if somebody looks like, if they've got their window down, I might say hi. Uh, you know, I try to gauge it and not be invasive or creepy or weird, but <laughs> I hope I'm not. But yeah, it's like I've, I've had so many great conversations at Superchargers. I love that, sa- that aspect of it. I love that side of it. That's what I was starting to say. So uh, yeah, Tyler was awesome to talk to. Later on the way home, I don't know if he'll hear this, Sk- uh, Sky from, from the Gustine Supercharger, who uh, isn't a listener of the show, but he we got to talking and and uh, he maybe he'll hear this if he checks out the show. But anyway, uh, as to the rest of my trip, so uh, before I started back home, uh, one of my dear friends who I hadn't seen in a couple of years, my really my best friend, the, the brother I never had, Robert. He uh, he had, he had moved down with his family down uh, south out of the Phoenix area, just to a town north of Tucson. And so I, I had told him we'd set up ahead of time. I would come down. I was happy to drive the car down and come see him. And, and so we did that and we had a nice time. And then on my way back, I'm coming up interstate 10, which is technically I 10 West, even though at that stretch of it, you're driving due North from Tucson to Phoenix. But, uh, I just see, I just saw like, just come at me like a, like a, like a, what must a hundred mile an hour fastball must look like 
to a to a major league baseball hitter. I just saw this flash of gray uh, come at me, about the size of uh, eh, like a like maybe a super ball. Like if you're, I guess if you're old enough to remember the little like super high bouncy super balls, probably actually a little bit bigger than that. But at least that size, maybe a little bit bigger. I just saw this gray thing come at me in the blink of an eye smack off the top of the windshield, like the top of my eye line, and keep going, and and instantly left behind a big, you know, divot crack. So, uh, took my windshield, <laughs> robbed it of its integrity, and so I was cursing up a storm. There's nobody else in the car. I was just, I was just uh, not thrilled about that. And then, until... A minute later, I calmed down and went, well, wait a second. Yeah, this stinks, but it would have been worse if it had hit, if it had gone a little higher and hit the glass roof. That would have been uh, a more complicated uh, and more expensive, presumably, although maybe same glass deductible on the insurance. I don't know. But anyway, at least it wasn't the glass roof. But then I thought about it again, and I was really thankful, in fact, that if it was going to hit me, that it did hit the windshield, because if this rock had hit the hood, the paint protection film would not have protected. I mean, it might have protected the paint, depending, but th- it, that rock, I'm convinced, absolutely would have dented the hood, which would have been a more annoying and possibly difficult repair. So, yeah, not great, but uh, I guess it could have been worse. And still, I guess, I'll tell you, my friends, I've been a little bit snake bit. With the spirit of adventure, uh, and compared to the car, any car I've had before, I'm now just over five months into owning my Model 3, and I've had three nails and tires, two paint protection film tears, and now a rock in the windshield. So the good news is that none of that has caused permanent damage. But the So again, I'm trying to look at the silver lining on this, but... Man, it has been. Uh, I've been a bit of a of a damage magnet, of a of a problem magnet. So, yeah, I, get, I don't know if my permanent magnet motors are <laughs> are attracting trouble. So, oh my goodness. So, yeah, I took got to get my windshield replaced. Thankfully, I had already before I left. I'd looked at my mileage before I left, and and I knew that it was going to be about a sixteen hundred mile round trip, and I'd do some driving while I was there. So I was going to be due for a tire rotation when I got back anyway. So I actually made that appointment before leaving uh, through my phone. My first appointment made right in the smartphone, right in in the app now that you can do that. And so I just went back in and edited my appointment. You can go back in and edit your notes. And I had just tire rotation in there. And I added a little note about, uh, hey, I hope you have a windshield in stock because I need one of those too. So actually, I still need to follow up with Tesla and make sure that they have Model 3 windshields in stock. Uh, What else can I tell you about the trip? I guess just quickly then that the actual return trip was was easy. Boy, was it easy. It really went well. I didn't have my daughter with me this time. I bought her a one-way ticket home. We figured, well, we'll we'll try it on the way down, but let's buy her a ticket for the way home uh, with her mom in case... Uh, with my wife in case, uh, you know, in case the drive down goes terribly and I don't, you know, and neither one of us <laughs> wants to be stuck together in a car for 15, 16 hours again. But, you know, she had done great. But yeah, so she got on the plane. It was just me and Daisy returning home. And I have to say, first of all, again, the trip itself was easy. Daisy is like the, she was an angel. She just laid right down. She didn't cause a fuss. She didn't seem anxious. She she was just great the entire time at the su- at every supercharger stop. She would get out, sniff around. She would she would relieve herself. Um, she was just wonderful. She really was, and and uh, just could not have asked for a for a better canine travel companion. No car sickness sickness at all, thankfully. And as for my efficiency, I told you about my efficiency on the way down. Uh, so this t- return trip, it was th- I had 309 watt hours per mile, which was up slightly. I did 304 on the way down there. So I attribute that difference 
I actually did take a slightly different route, um, it, which, I mean, theoretically, this route was probably easier because I just went, uh, well, I'm not going to bore you with the details. It was kind of the more direct route compared to going up and around a little bit on the way there due to traffic and accidents that were on the, the main freeways. But anyway, I, I, may, I mostly attribute the slight uh, decrease in efficiency to the fact that I was able to drive faster overall, uh, mostly 75 to 80 miles an hour the entire way, uh, and almost no traffic. Only right near Magic Mountain, where there's a ton of road construction, did I uh, have stop and go for, it was probably a half hour, 45 minutes. Thankfully, again, autopilot right there just takes care of business. You don't even have to do anything, but great trip. Uh, really enjoyed it, and it just, it just didn't feel like a 15, 16 hour thing, which is what it was. But, um, yeah, these, it's, I'm, I feel more confident and comfortable now road tripping in an electric vehicle, road tripping in a Tesla. And it was just fun. It was super fun. And that's that. Uh, the pro tip of the week this week comes from me, something I learned on the trip. So at one of the times that I had to go to the Scottsdale Supercharger, because I think I went about three different times, all told, I was charging up, of course, that's what you do there, and uh, I was finished, and I went to remove the Supercharger cable, and I pressed the button and started to try to pull the cable out, and it locked, and I got a red light on the charge port, that, that red Tesla T logo that's on the Model 3 charge port. Uh, it, it went red and I was getting error messages on the screen. I tried rebooting the screen, hard reboot, N nothing, nothing, uh, fixed it. So I had to call roadside assistance. And after a short wait there, the, the kind woman on the phone had clearly seen this before, immediately told me what to do. So I just wanted to pass this info along to you guys. If you ever run into a situation where your charging cable locks, in your charging port, and there's not, and you're getting error messages on the screen. You can't get it out, uh, and you've got a, you've got red lights that are bad. Uh, so the thing to do, and in the Model Three, actually, I I don't know if this applies to SRX. They've got to have it. I'm just not sure. Presumably, it's in the same spot. But on Model Three, look, open the trunk, and then look up and to the left, basically, you know, right behind where the charging port is. You'll see. Uh, basically the sort of vents cut into the fabric, the, the trunk lining carpet fabric. And uh, in the left on the left side of that, you'll see a, a larger opening as opposed to just a vent opening. Well, if you stick your fingers through there, there is a, a little rubber grip. There is a, a man, it's a manual release. So just grab on that, grab on that, pull it, and you'll hear the charging cable release. You can take the charging cable out, and boom, you're done and on your way. So if that ever happens to you, no need to panic, no need to call roadside. Uh, the woman on the phone told me that this is a known issue, and that they are, there's, uh, she said, again, it's just pass along what she said, we'll see if it actually happens or if it's quite going to be this way, but yeah, she said there's going to be a software update, which I presume would just alter the, the cable release behavior, maybe, uh, leaving it un unlocked longer before it relocks and, and can potentially get stuck if you've got it in the wrong spot there. So there you go. I just wanted to pass that along. And, uh, and there's that. I hope uh, if that does happen to you, I hope, or I hope that's helpful to you. Time to hit the road here. I want to start by mentioning abstractocean.com, an excellent source for all kinds of cool Tesla aftermarket goodies. I see, I'll tell you, I see a number of cars that have the Abstract Ocean T-E-S-L-A letters on the back trunk of the Model 3. Uh, you know, they take their T logo off and put on the Roadster style letters. And it looks pretty good. If you put them on there right, if you, if you do a good clean install, uh, they, it looks really good. So they've got that stuff. They've got the tempered glass screen protectors. They've got, of course, the big popular seller is the the puddle lights that shine down a, you know a Tesla T logo or a SX or 3 logo onto the ground for you kind of get that bat signal thing going on underneath your car underneath your open door at nighttime so abstractocean.com 
Uh, use the coupon code RTL Podcast, all one word, to get 15% off. Use that code at checkout, 15% off of your very first order with Abstract Ocean. Meanwhile, Immaculate Reflections, I can personally attest, uh, did a great job on my car. If you are interested in any of the following, new car uh, prep, paint correction, paint protection film, C-Quartz Finest uh, Reserve Ceramic Coating, any of that stuff, all of that stuff, Immaculate Reflections can take good care of you as they did to me. Check out their website for more information at irdetailing.com. Jeff's got 16 plus years of experience detailing cars. He does good work. Meanwhile, uh, Luxendary.com has some fun Tesla-inspired smartphone cases. So if you go to Luxendary.com slash RTL, anything you buy from that URL will have an automatic 15% discount code baked right into your order. Uh, Let's see. If you are ordering a Tesla, again, I encourage you to find somebody's referral code to use. Maybe a, a friend, family member, coworker that you can hopefully get them a prize from the referral program. But if I am the the lone source of of uh, Tesla ness in your life for now, you can definitely use my code to just make sure you get that six months of free unlimited supercharging. My code is Ryan seven three zero one four. You can either give that to a sales advisor or if you're ordering online, just type in. TS.LA slash Ryan73014, and that will let you order your car with that six month supercharging perk built into it. And again, uh, for European orders, you guys have to, at least for now, you guys have to uh, follow an, an email procedure to Tesla in order to get a referral code added. I gave the instructions for that at the beginning of episode 175 of the podcast, so please refer back to that if need be. Uh, Patreon, that is the primary means through which you can support the show if you're interested. I mean, hey, uh, just you listening is great, but if you want to take it a step further and support me monetarily in a purely voluntary way, you can learn more at patreon.com slash Podcast. Patreon spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. I want to say hello. Uh, So there's the Patreon producer tier. One of the perks they get is, of course, getting their name mentioned at the end of every episode. The newest Patreon producer is Tyler. Tyler, thank you so much for your support. And thanks as well to the rest of the Patreon producers, Blake Wiley, Daniel Grummer, Michael Waddle, Ground Level Painting, Stig Mickey Jensen, Luxendary.com, Dory and Steve Guberman, Joel Sapp, Lyle Austin, Bill Royko, Rick Sinta, Brian Hope, Jerry and Mary Smith, Gabriel Salaise, Luke Miles, David Nondahl, Eric Randolph, Luke A., Ulrich Lassa, David Vakil, Rome Strack, Harold Plug, Peter Chalet, Lars Hoffman, Lee Sweet, Marcus Mayenshine, Tim Hyde, Emotion Rentals, Jason Chalukas, Robert Maracle, Michael Lester, Matthew Para, Logan Willis, Alexi Heft, Jonathan Wales, David Brander, George Cassiopo, Wolfgang Obergen, Pete White, DJ Harbaugh, and Paul Hussey. Thank you all so much for your continued support here into 2019. It really, like I said, it, it's, uh, it is the difference between me doing this show and, and really not being able to, to do it. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. That's totally free. All subscribing does is downloads the show to you automatically every week rather than you having to go download it yourself. So subscribe on any, whatever your favorite podcast service is, whether it's iTunes and the iTunes podcasts app. Uh, If you're a mobile listener, there's the Google podcasts app, there's Stitcher, there's Spotify, Tune in, which is how you get it through your Tesla. Uh, and uh, oh, well, there's the hosting site, teslapodcast.libsyn, L I B S Y N, dot com, where you can grab individual shows or the RSS feed if, uh, if you're an RSS user. And then the show is also on YouTube. You could always subscribe on there too. It's just the, uh, the audio 
of the show. Just search Ride the Lightning Tesla Podcast and you'll find my channel there. I think that about wraps it up. Uh, I mentioned, you know, you can always email me, teslapodcast at gmail.com. Tweet me, at DMC underscore Ryan. Same, uh, the Instagram's the same address, DMC under, or the same username, DMC underscore Ryan on Instagram. Uh, yeah. Oh, if you're buying a wireless charging pad for your Model 3, sadly, I don't have a discount for you, but... The Jada folks, Jada Wireless Charging Pad, they were kind enough to set up a referral link, so they'll throw me a couple bucks if you order through my link here. So if you feel so inclined to do that, if you happen to be buying one of those, the link to use is getjada.com slash R-E-F slash 8, and Jada is spelled J-E-D-A. I do believe that wraps it up for a very passed out Daisy the Boxer puppy. She, boy, she is zonked out over there. I, I don't know how she's not bouncing off the walls after being in the car all day yesterday. But, I mean, we, we got out. We got a good couple of walks in today, but I would have expected she still <laughs> would be on fire. But, nah, she's passed out. I'll take it. Uh, all right, so thank you all so much again. Happy New Year. 2018 was was a blast. Here's to a, a super fun 2019 in the world of Tesla and here on Ride the Lightning. I'm thrilled to be here with you. I'm thrilled to have the the, the opportunity to do this for you every week. It's it's really a, a privilege of mine to get to to talk into a microphone for an hour plus every single week and have people actually want to listen to it. I don't take that lightly. I, I really I tell you. So thank you all very much. Happy New Year, happy electric motoring, and I'll see you next week. I mean, I think a Tesla it's the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. <laughs> That's what it's meant to be. Well, our goal is to make it's it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. Mm. Make it's maximum fun.